All right. Good evening, everyone. Really grateful that you're able to join us. I'm really excited to just walk through the end of the Gospel of Luke with each one of you. Um, it's been my heart, you know, just in the midst of wondering what we're to do during the, the weekend of Easter when there's supposed to be egg hunts and meals and and baptisms and, you know, all, all this wonderful stuff happening when none of that can happen, you know, what do you do? And so, you know, through prayer and talking with many of you, I've, I've come to the conclusion that why don't we just take this time of quietness to really focus on the text of the gospel. And so um, I'd like to take these aspects we're going to talk about. So like the Lord's Supper and his arrest and trial and, and crucifixion and the resurrection and take this time that we have and, and look at those things on a little bit deeper of a level. And so uh, have a better understanding of the gospel. Uh, maybe learn a little bit more about the character of God. Maybe learn a little bit more about you know the practical applications we can pull um, from the last few days when before Christ is 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 killed and then uh, gloriously resurrected. And so that's my heart. I hope that's your heart too. That we can just sit down. We can talk about these things. We can ask questions. Remember that while this is a recorded video, uh, I am live with you in the comments. So on Facebook and on YouTube. I'll have those pulled up. So if you have any questions, if something doesn't make sense, or you just have a comment um, through as we're reading the text that you'd like to make, um, I'm there with you. I'd love to hear it. And, and, of course, if it's a question, I'll do my best to answer it and just conversate with you the best that we can. And so uh, that's why I've pre-recorded this so that I can be with you live and, and, and talk with you as we're doing this. And so um, I'm going to pray for us, and then we will get into it. So if you will, bow your heads and pray with me. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word. And Lord, in the midst of this trial, we thank you for the opportunity to just sit down in the quiet and study absolute truth. Study your word, the holy scriptures. And I pray that it would infect our hearts and our minds and that it would cause us to be more like your son. And so, Father, I pray that you're glorified over the next four days as we study your word together. And then, of course, that we're edified, that we might um, learn how to be better servants, husbands, wives, kids, whatever whatever role that we find ourselves in, Father, that, um, that we would just be better at it in terms of being more biblical, more godly, and, uh, Father, that your will would be done. So that's what I ask overall. And that uh, if anyone jumps on this that does not know you, that, Father, by the reading of your gospel, this good news that you have, that they would hear it and that they would believe it and that they would confess you as Lord. So I pray that you would save souls through this, if you will. And, Father, um, thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so just taking a moment to kind of catch us up, because we haven't been going through Luke or anything, so catch us up with where we're going to jump in at in the story in chapter 22. Remember that Christ has, has you know, declared that the, the kingdom is at hand. Repent of your sins and, and believe in him. Uh, turn to God. And, and, and that, you know, he, he's saying that, you know, he's the Messiah. He's, he, he's, he's going gonna to change everything. It's here. It's finally happening. And, of course, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests and, and all of these things, all, all these people, they're, they're so tired of hearing this. They're so over it. And he's doing all these miracles, and he's gathered this huge following who don't necessarily believe that what he's saying is true, but he's doing miraculous things. And so as a sight, um, they want to follow him and, and see it. And um, there's a lot of people that are following him. And so on Monday— um, in, in this time period, he, he comes into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, a, a very humbling picture. And because he's not there to take over, you know, he could have rode in on a white horse and a shield and a sword and easily have just declared with a loud voice, Jerusalem is mine, and made a hostile takeover in, in two seconds. Um, and he'll explain that that's not his purpose here as we read these last few chapters. Uh, he's there to die. He's he he's there to win anyone who would believe in him to a relationship with the Father and eternal life. And so it's 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 almost comical to see 
that, you know, beforehand he's being very secretive about who he is. He would do miracles and ask people not to share that information with anyone because he knew that the more people who um, knew what he was saying and the, and the more people that got on board, the quicker he was going to be put to death. He knew he was going to die, but it wasn't time yet. And so he was being a little bit um, secretive uh, about his messages. He was speaking in parables so not everyone would understand. Um, but here, as he goes into Jerusalem for the last time, just a few days before his death, that being that Monday, um, he's it, it, he's done with these guys. He's so done with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the leaders. He's not he's not pulling any punches anymore. And he goes into the temple and remember that the temple was like the most holy place on earth. That's where God's presence was. That's where. Um, you know, the, the high priest was that spoke on behalf of the people of God. And, and he walks in and there's just goats and sheep and doves everywhere for sale. And the point of that was that, you know, at once a year for Passover, and I'll get into what Passover is in just a second, but you had to bring in, you know, certain animals to be sacrificed for certain sins according to Le Levitical laws. And so instead of people taking one of their own lamb or sheep or, or doves or, or whatever they were supposed to bring to sacrifice or raising it up and it being of one of their herd that, that was really supposed to, you know, be a sacrifice for them. They just walk into the temple and like a grocery store, they would just pick out whatever one they wanted to. And then that person would walk it back to the high priest. Boom, they were done. They didn't even have to be there. And so the whole heart behind the sacrificial system was just blown to pieces. It was over and Jesus just goes in and wrecks habit. He drives them out. He does all these things. And then, you know, he's even talking about, you know, this this temple is is going to be destroyed. And in three days, I'm going to build it up. And and they're like, <laughs> did you did you guys hear what he just said? Did he just say he was going to destroy our temple? Like, we need to take action quick. And so, obviously, Jesus knows it's time. Um, and, 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 of course, it's these things that are going to lead to him. Um, being crucified, and so he's ready for it. His patience is over with, and uh, um, we, we just see him, you know, teaching. And he even goes in from Monday till where we're going to jump in on the story, which is Thursday. Um, he, he's teaching in the temple, and, and he's teaching good things. And, and of course, the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees and all these leaders, they're still trying to get him to slip up and say something that's untrue, and they can't do it. He, he's so brilliant in terms of theology because, I don't know, he's God, and so he knows what the truth is, and, and he knows their hearts behind what they're saying, and so he just keeps making them look bad. They're getting fed up with it. And so that's where we're going to jump into the story here. So chapter 22, verse 1 says this, Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called Passover. So I want to take just a quick moment for anyone who may not know what Passover is, because it is kind of important in terms of the story. Remember that Israel was enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, 435 years to be exact. Um, and they, were, they, they, they had grown numerically to such an extent that they were being heavily persecuted because Pharaoh was worried that, hey, soon these slaves are going to outnumber my own people, and what's going to stop them from just taking over Egypt, like the, God was blessing them so much numerically, the Israelites, and so they were in massive persecution. They, they were harsh, harsh slave labor, and so he gets Moses. He comes in, and and eventually, um, he's he's going to rescue Israel from um, captivity here. But but the straw that broke the camel's back, the last thing that he was going to do to let or or to make Pharaoh let. Israel go and no longer be enslaved was that he was going to have the angel of death come over um, Egypt and um, kill all of the family's firstborn, which is a, a brutal thing. Um, but God knew what it was going to take. That was his plan from the beginning. And so uh, he, he, he says this angel is going to come in and it's going to murder, you know, all, 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 all firstborn of the families, but it wouldn't kill Israel any firstborn of a family who sacrificed a lamb and spread its blood over the threshold uh, of the door. 
which obviously is a reference to Christ. I mean, yes, it worked in that time, but it's it makes way too much sense in terms of what Christ's blood has done for us, which we'll get to in just a little bit. But um, obviously a reference um, to, to our lamb, Jesus Christ being slain, and that when we spread his blood over our lives, our bodies, our hearts, our minds, when, whenever we're covered in his blood, um, that death will pass over us, that, that, that wrath that God has promised to put forth on all humanity will we'll be able to avoid that because of Christ. And so um, obviously a reference to that. But in this time, they're just remembering what God did for Israel in Egypt, and they do it every year. They do it once a year. And Israel was a large nation at this point. And so you kind of had a, a northern and a southern half of the country. But Levitical state Le- Levitical um, law stated that for Passover, you had to be within the walls of Jerusalem. So you got, man, you got a million people trying to fit within this city, which is is not the largest city in the world, especially in terms of a million people. And so they were packed anyway. But for for having the entire, you know, of course, you just had to send one representative of your family. But still, you're looking at a lot of a lot of people in this one city. And so you've got hotels or motels, I guess. They didn't really have hotels. They might have had hotels. But you at least had motels. They were all booked. You couldn't find a place to stay. The city was packed for Passover. And so uh, it was drawing near. And, and for Jesus and the disciples, it's going to happen on Thursday night. And a lot of people don't know this, but there were actually two Passovers. There was one on Thursday, and there was one on Friday each year. And what had happened was, you know, Israel had grown to such an extent that you couldn't sacrifice these things in a single day for all these families, um, it was just too much work for the priest. He couldn't do it. And so what what northern Israel did, so Galilee, where Jesus is from and where most of the disciples are from, is they would calculate their days differently than what southern Israel would do. So northern Israel, they would say a a day is from uh, sunset to sunset. And then uh, northern or southern Israel would say sunrise to sunrise. And so for northern Israel, uh, Passover started Thursday night. And then for southern Israel, Passover started Friday morning and lasted until Friday evening. And so uh, there were actually two Passovers, and Jesus and the disciples, they're celebrating Passover on Thursday night because as, as the sun goes down, so starts that next day. And so the feast was drawing near, which is called Passover. And then verse 2 says this, And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. So they're thinking that Jesus has come into town, and he's wanting to start an uprising. He's wanting to revolt, and he's wanting to establish it. And they're worried because there's a lot of people that are following him. Now, again, remember that they don't necessarily believe what he has to say. They're just there for the show. But still, when you have a guy... um, that is being followed by thousands of people, you get a little nervous. And and of course, they know that Jesus is against them and what they've been teaching uh, the people of Israel for, you know, 30 years now. I mean, since Jesus has been there, he's been against them. Um, And everybody knows him as a really good teacher, a really respectable teacher. As a matter of fact, from Monday to Thursday, he's in the temples teaching uh, before he dies. And so they're, they're trying to figure out, they're like, look, there's no more silencing him in terms of just getting his voice out of the way. Uh, we don't need to just arrest him. We've got to kill him. We've got to put it into this. Otherwise, he's going to take over Jerusalem. Um, and so uh, they're seeking how to put him to death. And then verse 3 says, Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. And so the first thing I want to point out, and again, I won't take this much time because we got 65 verses to read this evening, and I don't want to keep you forever. Um, But one thing that jumps out that I want to touch on is a lot of people say Judas can't be responsible because... Um, Satan entered into him. So Satan took possession of Judas's body to do this. He's going to do it here when he's going to go consult with these people and make a deal with them 
to uh, betray Jesus. And then he's also going to do it after uh, the Lord's Supper when he goes and, and lets them know where Jesus is going to be to arrest him. Um, and I don't want to get into a whole topic of demonology, but I do want to un- want you to understand that Judas is easily responsible for this personally because one isn't just possessed by Satan or possessed by a demon. And I know that works a little bit differently here in America uh, than it does in other parts of the world, and especially what it looked like thousands of years ago. Satan just works differently than he used to. Um, and, and the overall idea there is if you've got people doing miraculous things, like there's a man that lives up in the caves and he's chained to rocks and he just keeps breaking them instantly because he's so strong, obviously beyond human strength. Well, then people are going to believe in a higher power. They're going to believe in the spiritual realm where we've got, what, 25 to 30, probably higher than that now, of people in America that don't believe in any type of spiritual realm. So Satan has got us in a much worse spot um, than previously. So why would he do all these miraculous things when it would only cause us to, again, believe in a spiritual realm? And so um, that's why we don't see a lot of that today. But in terms of demonic possession, you've got different stages of that. You've got infestation where you do a particular sin that allows the demon to come and, and be amongst you. And then you've got oppression where the demon is, is kind of speaking words into your heart and your mind. And this does happen. Don't, don't make it sound like it doesn't. I don't want to make it sound like it doesn't happen because it certainly does. Um, it just works a little bit differently now. But, uh, you know, then, then that sin, whatever sin that demon is associated with, once you participate in that sin, uh, he's going to continually put it on your heart and your mind. And the idea is to weaken you down further and further and further, obviously until um, you're weak enough where that demon can take possession of you. So you do see demonic possession in Scripture, in the New Testament. Um, I do believe it happens today. Again, I think it's much less so than it used to because Satan just works differently now. But um, Judas was, was certainly held responsible because even though, yes, he was entered into by Satan, um, he, he had this sin, whatever it was. We're thinking it most likely was monetary value. He seemed pretty concerned with money throughout Jesus' ministry, and of course that's what um, he gets for betraying Jesus was money. And uh, he allows it to come to his life. It oppresses them. And then what we have, and, and just logically speaking, if we have the Holy Spirit that is sealed in us and we can't lose the Holy Spirit, then we can't have another spirit inhabit us. And so you can't be possessed by a demon if you're a Christian. It's, it's biblically impossible. It's logically impossible. Um, we can only have, be possessed by one spirit or the other. And so uh, that, that being the Holy Spirit, I'm grateful for that. But that doesn't mean that we can't invite demonic oppression. We, 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 we can't struggle with these things because there's demonic activity in our life. That can certainly happen. Um, but but for Judas, he, he willingly did it, and obviously uh, he, he, he wasn't a believer. He was in it for selfish reasons. And so they're, they, they're just, they, they come up to Judas, or Judas goes to them, and they're basically like, look, we, we, we have to do something in secret. There's people all around them all the time, and if we do this in a sketchy way, people are going to ask questions. And so um, they, they, they need someone on the inside. And so Judas says, hey, I'm on the inside. I'm one of his disciples. Um, I'll let you know when he's going to be by himself. And so they put the opportunity into place. So verse 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread, or on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So now it's Thursday. Uh, Excuse me, I think I said what we had already read was Thursday. It was actually Wednesday as they're getting ready. But verse 7, now we've entered uh, Thursday, Passover day. And then uh, the lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And so it's day of the Passover. They've got to get the lamb ready. They, 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 they've got to sacrifice, or they've got to bring it to the priest to sacrifice. Um, and then they've got to find a place to, to have this, um, the Lord's Supper with, this, this Passover meal. And so he, he sends Peter and John, two of his disciples, to go do that. And they're like, well, where do you want us to prepare it? And it's not like a, 
anywhere. It's like, <laughs> where, remember, there's so many people here. It's like, where in the world is a place that we can do this? Like, this is kind of last minute, but obviously Christ had, he had a plan beforehand. He had organized this, but we do see his omniscience or his all knowingness in this text where he says, you're going to see a man carrying a jar of water. First of all, this is weird because men really didn't do this in this time. It was mainly women that carried the jars of water on their head. Remember, you know, I'm sure you've seen pictures of that. Um, so the fact that he knew that this man was going to be carrying a jar of water was rare enough. But the fact that he was going to be carrying that jar of water at the exact time that the disciples entered the city w was just beyond um, coincidental. And I don't think, some people think that what he meant was like Jesus told this guy, hey, take this jar of water put it on your head and just stand by the entry gates until these disciples get here. Uh, that That's not what he did. Um, he did meet with this. Obviously, there was a place prepared, but he's just using omniscience saying, hey, when you enter the city, this is what the scene is going to look like. Follow this guy who has this jug of water. And so Jesus knew what the scene was going to look like into the future, which again uh, is evidence that he might be more than human. In fact, he is God and he knows all things. And so... Um, they go and they get it all set up so that they can uh, share in the Passover together and, and have that sacrifice. And then we start uh, the Passover meal here in verse 14. It says, When the hour came, he reclined at table in the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom. And so Jesus kind of gets pretty ominous and pretty serious with him. And he says, um, you know, after this, I'll never eat this Passover meal again until this kingdom that I've promised you is established on earth. And so he, he and he's like, I'm about to suffer. And he's told him he's going to about to suffer. The disciples really don't know what's about to happen. And they know that what he said and, and, and done has led up to a point. And they know things are getting serious. And we're going to see that they're pretty stressed out but they don't realize the magnitude of what he's about to go through. And so he was very anxious to have this meal with them. Of course, he's instituting the Lord's Supper and why we do it today, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, verse 17, And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after he had eaten, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so we, here we have the first practice of the Lord's Supper, and it literally is the Lord doing it. And so it's a really special time. And again, it's just so odd in our world today um, to, to anyone that doesn't truly understand what this is about, the idea that this is my body, this is my blood. Like it seems so ritualistic or, or, or even, you know, um, cultic in, 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 in terms of sacrifice and blood and drinking blood and whatnot. Um, and obviously, you know, as Christians, we don't believe that this is the body of Christ or that this is the blood of Christ, but it's symbolic. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. And that's what I really want to hone in on for the purpose of taking the Lord's Supper. Yes, it's absolutely a way to worship him for what he's going to do. The fact that we take in his body in, in terms of uh, we, we accept the death of Christ as proficient or as effective for our sin. We put our sins on Christ and, and we allow sin to affect his body and, and kill him so that we don't have to experience that wrath that God's going to pour out on him. God's wrath has already been satisfied because we took our sins and we put them on Christ. And so that's that ingestion of that blood, or I'm sorry, the ingestion of, of the flesh of Christ. It helps us remember that and then his blood, the new covenant. Remember that in the old covenant, how you got right with God, there had to be spilling of blood because the wages of sin is death. And while obviously our bodies are going to have to die at some point um, because they're infected with sin, we're going to be given new bodies. But until then, uh, you know, we, we, we struggle in the bodies that we have. But uh, blood had to be spilled in order for God's wrath to be atoned. 
um, for, for, for us to not have to experience God's wrath. That was the sacrificial system of Leviticus. However, in the new covenant, which the disciples don't fully understand yet, the covenant that we are in with God, that the, the people of the Old Testament were in a different one, but the one we're in is no longer animal sacrifices, but the sacrifice of Christ. And so um, his blood that, that we ingest, it, it's, again, remember, you know, the Passover thing, the idea that the lamb's blood spread out over the door um, kept us from the wrath of God so that when we drink, you know, the, the, from the vine there, that, that fruit or wine or whatever it is, uh, that, that we're remembering that we, are, we have put Christ's blood on our doorstep so that the wrath of God would pass over us. So we still, when, when we take the Lord's Supper together, we're still celebrating the Passover because we're celebrating the future Passover of God's wrath on us. Um, it has been satisfied. We don't have to be worried about God's wrath anymore because Christ's blood was shed and his blood was effective for us. And so when we take the Lord's Supper, we, we, we have those biblical principles in our minds when we do it. But overall, do this in remembrance of me. It's so that we can remember the gospel. It, it's so that, you know, if we've had a tough day, um, man, it's so easy to forget that we're a child of God. It's so easy to forget all the promises that God has made us um, as his children and has, as co-heirs with Christ to this new earth. And, and you know, Satan so often is effective in us forgetting that we're saved and, and forgetting that, you know, regardless of what happens in our life, we're with God and, and he's going to protect us and he's going to watch over us and he's going to be with us for eternity on the new earth. And so, um, you know, when we do that together as a church family, we do it as a way of remembering, look, we're all brothers and sisters here and we all live in a world that is tough and, and has issues but um, still yet we're saved and we have a purpose here and we're united in that purpose. And so that's why I think um, participating in the Lord's Supper is so uh, helpful. It's glorifying to God, but it's also very edifying for us because we need to remember the gospel often. We need to remember what we believe and what we trust in very often. And so he does this with them for the first time, and they don't really know what he's talking about. I'm sure there's a massive confused look on their face as he's talking about, this is my flesh, this is my blood in the new covenant. Um, they, they don't know. And remember, they don't have the Holy Spirit. So they're being led by Christ, which is wonderful, but their hearts are still hard. Their, their minds are still um, not renewed. And so they, they, they have a lot of room to grow. And, and we're going to see that when Christ dies, they, they really struggle with that. Um, but thankfully that they'll all survive to the point where um, they receive the Holy Spirit and then God's with them in a completely new way, in a, a life-changing way. But they take the Lord's Supper together, and then it says this. i got to go a little bit faster. Um, verse 21, But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they begin to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. And so after they've taken the Lord's Supper together, after they've become unified in, in, in Christ, and, and again, they don't fully understand it, but we do today, that when we take the Lord's Supper together, we're rejoicing in the fact that we're saved, we're remembering the gospel, and we're glorifying Christ for what he did for us. Um, the beating of his flesh, the spilling of his blood, um, as a sacrifice for our sins so that we don't have to experience the wrath of God. It would pass over us. But he said, one person that has participated in this is going to betray me and didn't mean it. He didn't mean it. And so, again, naturally, verse 23, they'd be qu questioning one another. Dude, are you it? Are you it? Who, who in the world is going to do this? And remember that Judas has already met with the people, so he knows. But I'm sure he's an active participant in trying to deny that he's the one. And so they're questioning one another. And it's interesting that in verse 24, the, the conversation, you just see how far off the disciples' hearts are from where they need to be right now. And, and it's just a, a further example of our need for the Holy Spirit. Like Jesus is with them. And still yet, they never get his teaching. Um, only by the grace of God does Peter finally understand that he's Christ when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And that's when his name changed from uh, Simon to Peter for on this rock 
I will build my church, that, that rock being the idea of faith, having faith that Christ is God and came to save us. Um, but they're, they're questioning one another. They're, they're trying to figure out who did it. And almost you know, instantly, just a very smooth uh, transition into a dispute they're having as to who's the greatest. So they go from who's going to betray Jesus, who really doesn't believe all this, um, who, who's, who's the enemy to, well, who's the best? Yeah, you know, so I can I can see that conversation where it's like, are you gonna do? It? Why would you ask me if I'm the? I sit right next to Jesus every single meal, or you know, well, well, I did this for you know, and so th- their their minds and their hearts are so far off from where they're supposed to be because they need the Holy Spirit and they don't have it. And so in verse twenty four, a dispute rises as to who's the best, who's the greatest, out of all the disciples. So I'm sure Jesus was uh, glad to hear that that's where the conversation had gone at this point right after we, we've talked about our need uh, for salvation by the Lord's Supper. So verse 24 says, A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. So he's talking about world authority and how um, those who are seen to have the most authority are considered the greatest in our world. Verse 26, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as the one who serves. For who is the greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. And so he kind of flips culture on its head in in our culture too, where he says, you want to be considered greatest in terms of the kingdom of God and, and being the best servant for Christ, um, then you have to understand that the, the one who is the greatest is the one who's the most childish or, or the youngest is, is what they say. So what does that mean? That means the one who is seen as the greatest or the best servant or the best child of God is the one who most realizes his need, his dependency on God. As a child is dependent on his parents, so should the best servant of God be the one who recognizes the most how much he needs him. And so the one who not gains the most authority, but gives the most authority to God in his life. And so, again, the the purpose is not to battle with one another to see which of us can be the most um, childish in terms of giving our authority to someone else or recognizing our need or our dependency on God um, in order to, you know, the the battle there. It's almost impossible to even have because the closer you get to God, the less you're concerned with um, where someone else is at in terms of their greatness level with God. Like that's the whole point of humility and humbleness. It's just like, look, I don't know where anyone else is at, but, but the person who's closest to God is the one who says, look, I just know that I need him every moment of every day. And that's why I think Paul was, was close to that. If we're, if we're going to create a scale here on holiness and, and how we, what we believe about God and where we sit on this scale, um, I think Paul is the closest because where he's where he talks about um, that Christ is the save the savior of sinners of whom I am the foremost. So I think the person who's the greatest is the kingdom is the person who sees their sin as the worst possible, and not this this pity me you know have have pity on me feel sorry for me but this the person who who. Um, is the greatest is the one who recognizes their need and, and, and recognize, look, I'm just a person in need of a Savior. Even as Christians, I'm a person who needs God every moment of every day. That's those who are the greatest because that's those um, who have the right mindset and the right heart. And so um, it's not those who have the most power. The ones who have the least are those who are the greatest because they give that power to God. And then verse 28, it says, You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So this can mean one of two things. This can either mean that he's talking about that the disciples, though not all of them um, wrote letters, that they were kind of the 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 judges or the rulers of the church age in which we live today because they wrote what we believe they 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 wrote this word by the by way of the holy spirit or this can mean that during the millennium whenever Christ comes down and, and rules on earth that the, the his 12 disciples will be with him helping him co-lead 
And so he's just showing them that, look, even in the midst of this, even in the midst that you don't understand, Jesus knows what they're going to do in the future. And so um, he, he's going to give them a point of, of recognition um, in saying that, you know, uh, those that who is the least is the greatest. But he knows that, you know, as the Holy Spirit comes into play and starts molding their hearts, that the disciples are going to become very humble and, and, and show a lot of humility. And, and he's going to reward them for that. And then in verse 31, remember they're still at the table. They've performed the Lord's Supper, but they're still uh, still sitting at the table talking. Um, and then in verse 31, uh, Jesus is talking to Peter. And he calls him Simon. Remember, Simon is his name before he confessed Jesus as Lord. And so uh, he, he's kind of speaking to him on a human basis, talking about sinful things. And so he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And so Jesus talks to, to Peter, and he says that, you know, Satan is, is after you. And, and, and that you there is plural, so he's really talking to the midst of all the disciples who are sitting there at the table. And at this point, um, Luke doesn't talk about it, but at this point, most likely Judas is gone um, based on the other Gospels and when he leaves the table. But uh, most likely Judas is gone, but he's talking to the rest of the disciples, and he's saying that Satan's after him. He, he, Satan knows that only bad could come of this, that you know, in, in the midst of Christ uh, having these people that can continue his work, and, and whatnot, and so he, he's trying to—he's got one. He got Judas, but he's not going to get any more because Jesus prayed on their behalf that their faith wouldn't fail. And so Peter kind of gets built up by this. You know, Peter's probably one of the more emotional uh, disciples. He's the one that jumps out of the boat and swims uh, to see Jesus after his resurrection, and then it says that the disciples got there um, pretty much at the same time Peter did. So uh, just, just an emotional guy, a passionate guy. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but he does act on emotion uh, primarily. And Peter gets uh, kind of built up. And in verse 33, he, he says to Jesus, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. So th this big, strong statement from Peter uh, after Jesus has said that I've prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. And, and Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow. It's not even going to be a day um, until you've denied me three times until um, you've denied three times that you know me. And and, and so, of course, th this obviously is is startling to Peter. Um, but, but you just see that pride built up in him and, and that emotion built up in him. And then Jesus is going to say, look, you're going to deny me. All the disciples are going to really struggle when, when he goes. Their, 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 their doubts are going to take effect. And so um, he says that to Peter. And in verse 35, and he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his sword and buy one. For I tell you that the scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And he said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. This is a pretty interesting thing. And again, I'm kind of running out of time here. And I don't want to, you know, take all of your evening up. But it is 65 verses. Um, but uh, people kind of differ on, on what they think Christ means here whenever he's saying, look, remember when I sent you out and you didn't have any money? You didn't have any supplies? You didn't even have sandals? And he said, were you lacking anything? And they said, no. And then he said, now um, go get money, you know, uh, go get supplies. Um, if you don't have a sword, sell one of your cloaks and get a sword. And he's like, for I tell you, the scripture must be fulfilled. And he was numbered with the transgressor. So he's saying, I'm about to leave. Uh, I'm about to no longer be with you. And so, you know, be prepared for that. And I think he's talking about spiritually. I don't think he's talking about literally um, because obviously Jesus has not come to start a revolution. They don't need swords. I think he's talking about in a spiritual sense or a metaphorical sense as in you need to be prepared. And, of course, he's going to send them the Holy Spirit. Um, but especially during this time where this Saturday, this quiet Saturday, 
when nothing's happening. He's asking them to be prepared um, because it's going to be tough. But, of course, the disciples take it literally, and and one of them says, Look, Lord, here are two swords. And Jesus says to them, uh, It is enough. I don't think he means that literally. I think he's like, Sure. <laughs> Again, I think Jesus has, has done. He knows that they're they don't have the Holy Spirit. They need work. And so he says to them, It's enough. Yep, two swords, that'll do it. And I think he's he he he's just saying, You guys don't get it, and you're not gonna get it until um you have the Holy Spirit. Because they just weren't understanding what was going on at this time. But he's he's he understands that, you know, uh times are gonna be tough, especially on this Saturday when they're gonna be gone, when he's gonna be gone. And so that's what happens in that passage. Verse 39. And he came out and went, as was his custom. So Jesus normally did this. On on a regular basis, he would go out um, to the Garden of Gethsemane and pray. To the Mount of Olives. And the the garden was on that mount. uh, And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew with them about a stone's throw, And knelt down to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And so we really see the heart of Christ in this and the humanity of Christ in this. And I'm sure you've heard this. It's a really common passage. Um, But they go up there to pray, and he asks them to pray that they won't fall into temptation. And they don't really know what he's talking about yet. They don't understand that the temptation is, is quickly approaching. And, of course, we're going to see that they're not praying. In fact, they're sleeping. Um, but Jesus prays that, Father, if you are willing to remove this cup from me, Jesus doesn't want to take on the wrath of God for all of humanity. And we can't blame him. Like, he doesn't need, he doesn't have to do this. Um, but he does it because he loves us. And, and, and I don't think it's so much the pain that he doesn't want to experience rather than just this massive disobedience that he's taking all of our sin and all of our disobedience that could put us in hell and drinking that cup for us. He doesn't want to sin. He's lived the perfect life. Um, he, he hates sin. He hates the idea of sin because he's God and he's perfect. Yet he's going to, as the perfect sacrifice, take on this and have God look upon him, look, have the Father deal with him with wrath as if he had done those sins that we had done. And he doesn't want to do this. But he says, remove this, and nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So again, he, he gives us that diagram of prayer where we can lift up any request to God, where we can ask for anything. Um, but in the end, we should know that, Lord, whatever you're do, going to do, regardless of what I've asked you to do, I know that whatever you will is going to be for the best. It's going to be most glorifying to you, and it's going to be best for myself. And so This is what I would like for to happen, but Father, may your will, not mine, be done. And so Jesus doesn't want to do this, but he knows that he has to. He knows that this is a part of the plan because he loves us, and he wants to save us. And unless he does this, we're damned eternally. And so, um, verse 43, And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. So, you know, there's an angel that helps him pray in the midst of this anguish, this strife that he's struggling with. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And so this is either metaphorical or literal. Um, I think because it says like drops of blood, I consider it a simile because that's what I learned in Shirley English in third grade. Um, But it certainly could be physical. So metaphorically, just saying he was so stressed about this. He, he was in such agony thinking about taking on this sin um, and looking as if he were a sinner uh, that he was sweating to the point where it looked like he just had an open wound and it was just pouring off of him. Or uh, apparently scientifically there is this thing called, one second, I have it written down here, hematidrosis. So if you're in the medical field, you could probably correct my pronunciation of that. Um, but it's the idea that where you're so stressed and, and you're so you know, your, your, your blood is pumping so hard um, that you actually burst blood vessels that are close to your skin, and it mixes with your sweat glands, and so you're actually sweating um, blood that's mixed into your sweat to water. And so it could be that he was so concerned about doing this, and, and he so didn't want to do this, and everything that was going to happen that he knew was going to happen, um, he was in such agony about it, 
um, that he actually started sweating blood just just at the max amount um, of, of doing this. And so you see that none of us have been that stressed out. None of us have been in that much anguish or that much pain. Um, yet he still goes forth with it because he loves us. Praise God for that. Um, and when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And so he told them to do this. He does this twice, according to other gospels, where he goes and he checks on them, and they just keep going to sleep. And, and it says from sorrow, so they're, they're, they're stressed out too. Like they don't even know exactly what's going on, but they know Jesus is being super serious, and there's something bad that's going to happen, and they're upset, and they just, they're, they're spiritually and physically exhausted from all of these things. And so they're just sleeping, and Jesus is saying, you need to pray that you're not tempted. And again, you know, remember Saturday, he's not going to be there. Uh, they need to be strong. Peter is going to need to be strong way faster than that. And again, Peter's sleeping. He's not praying and, and he's going to fall into sin. And I think one thing practically that we can take out of that is the fact that we need to constantly pray that we're not led into temptation. Like the Lord's Prayer that Christ gave us as an example of a good way to pray is to say every day, Lord, May today I not be led into temptation because we never know when temptation is going to come. We never know when we're going to wake up one day and it's just going to be an awful day. Bad things are going to happen. It's going to put us in a bad mood. And if we're not prayed up, if we're not connected with God that morning, we're not going to be spiritually ready to not sin during that time. And so, you know, as Christians, as believers, may we have a constant prayer life where we're asking, Lord, hey, May I be strong enough. Don't lead me into temptation. No, don't allow me uh, to fall into sin whenever uh, the enemy is going to bring up obstacles during my day. But may I stay righteous. May I stay devoted to you. And so that's something that we should take into consideration. Not sleep. Not sleep on that. Not take that strength and that power that we've been given to pray and ask for that for granted. Because the disciples do that. And they sin because of it. Verse 47. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said to him, Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? So we, we learn that Judas says, Look, the person who I want you to arrest, and of course they know who Jesus is, um, but the sign to arrest him that time, go, um, was when he kissed Jesus' cheek. And so the, the betrayal of Judas's kiss, or the, that's what you gave to someone who you respected. And to see that dichotomy, that, that idea that you're going to kiss someone or show respect to someone, but in that same breath, in that same motion, um, you're betraying him and, and you're sending him to die. Even when Jesus has just said, cursed be that person um, who betrays the Son of Man. He's like, look, it's been written uh, since the, the prophetic times that this was going to happen. Uh, and it's been known since the creation of the world that this was going to happen. But woe be to the man who starts that process. And that was Judas. And when those around who were around saw him, what would follow? They said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. <laughs> and so uh, the disciples get a little antsy because they're seeing all these guards and all these high priests and stuff come out to, to see what's going on. And, and they get nervous. They're like, hey, should we, should we fight back? It looks like they're coming you know, to do something. And, of course, they are not exactly sure what's going on, but Jesus knows they're coming to arrest him. And so we actually learn from a different gospel that it's Peter who pulls out his sword and cuts off one of the guard's ears. Um, again, out of passion. Um, he was wrong to do that. Now, I think his heart was just to protect Jesus, which you can't blame him for doing that. But, again, if he would have been praying that he would not be led into temptation— uh, by, by the enemy, um, that this would have been a better look for him and for God as they maintain peace, uh, knowing that what was going to happen was supposed to happen. But Jesus is done with it. This is the actually the only time in Scripture where he seems to, you know, it's not a limb, but it's the the reconnection of a, a body part um, physically. He hadn't done that before. And so 
I, I think the purpose behind that is just to show, you know, Jesus has done a lot of things. He had healed the blind. He'd healed skin diseases, the lame, a lot of things, but never something quite so obvious as just having an ear, reconnecting it. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's just, just phenomenal. And, and to see the callousness and the hardness of the heart of people around him. If someone does that, there's something special about him. Maybe you should listen. And these people see it. This was an obvious thing. Uh, Peter pulls out his sword. He cuts off this guard's ear. And then Jesus just says, enough of this. I'm, I'm done with it. You know, enough with the disobedience. Enough with the fighting. I'm ready to get this going. I'm, I'm ready to have this happen. And so uh, we, we see him, you know, really kind of, you know, go from that, Lord, if this is even possible, please let this cut pass from me, um, to enough of this. Uh, he and, and I think one thing he sees is he says, sees that Peter is, is again acting in sin and, and doing this. And he's like, I know that through my death and through the work of the Holy Spirit, that this will renew their hearts and make them new. And so enough of this. That's a big word for me. Um, as I read this passage, is Jesus saying, enough of this sin, enough of this debauchery, um, enough of this fighting and this strife, enough of this misunderstanding of text, um, let's just get this over with. And so uh, you see Jesus really in a powerful position there, say, let's go, let's do it. And then uh, verse 52 says this, Then Jesus said to the chief priest and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out? as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, did you not lay hands on me? But this is your power, the power of darkness. So he's like, what, you know, and, and again, he knows this is supposed to happen, but he's like, why are you coming at me with with swords and stuff as if you think that I'm going to do anything bad? As if you think I'm going to start a revolt or uh, I'm someone that should be considered dangerous. He's like, I've been with you in the temple for four days teaching. Like, why are you treating me like this? Why is this happening? But at the end, he says, this is your hour and the power of darkness. So it, again, he's really referencing Lucifer here, saying, Lucifer, do what you're going to do. It's time. It's been said from the beginning that this is time. This, this, this reveal of, of from Eve that this seed was going to crush the serpent's head, that the, that, and, and in this moment that the serpent was going to strike the, the seed of Eve's heel, this is that moment. This is that power of darkness. This is that hour. He's like, whatever, I'm not changing anything. This has to be done, so let's go with it. And so um, we really see, you know, that serpent about to strike the hill. And we, we're we going to learn soon why it's just the hill that that serpent strikes. Verse 54. I apologize for the length of this. Uh, the, the others will most definitely be shorter. But, but I hope you are getting things out of this because it, it's good to look at this text and really break it down. And for those of you who know me, uh, it's very hard for me to even read three or four verses in 30 minutes, much less 65. And so um, give me some credit there. Verse 54. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was falling at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him, as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And so they, they arrest Jesus, and they take him to the home of the priest. Remember, it's, it's after dark here. Um, there's not going to be a ton going on because, you know, of course it's nighttime. Um, but they set this fire in the courtyard, and so there's all these people like, what What's going on? Why are all the king's guards out uh, why why is this all this commotion at the high priest's house like what is happening here it's a very odd situation especially you know the night before southern israel was going to start their their day of passover and so uh peter follows and we think also john probably followed as well and he's sitting there in the midst of it watching and th and this girl th this this servant girl sees him and says hey you you were you were also with him, right? And of course, he denied it, saying, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him, uh, verse 58, and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And so again, he, he's denied him twice now, uh, saying, I'm not with them. I'm not part of him. I don't know him, because he's scared. 
this is a, a new situation. I mean, he just cut off a guard's ear. He's he's freaking out. Uh, and now this guy that he's followed for the past three years is is in custody. And and probably something bad's going to happen to him. And so he's, he's unsure. He's unprepared. He hasn't been praying to not be led into temptation. So guess what he's doing? He's he's Again, he's falling into sin. He's falling into this temptation and sinning. Um, and then... After an interval, or verse 59, and after an interval of about an hour still another, so a couple hours into this, uh, another still insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Gal- Galilean. So remember again that you know the Galileans have come down to celebrate Passover, and so that wasn't a normal to hear that accent. The Galileans had a different accent that those in southern Israel did, and so it was very obvious that these people that have come down from Galilee, he, he was a Galilean, so he must be connected. He, 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 he has to be with them. I mean, I, I mean, you sound just like him. You sound like where he's from. But Peter said, uh, I do not know what you are talking about. And then immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine? <laughs> can, can you imagine after, you know, being built up and saying, you know, Jesus saying, I've prayed for you that you will not sin. And then you kind of get built up and you say, I'll, I'll never sin. I'll never, you know, Jesus wasn't saying that you'll never trip up. He's never saying that you'll never fall. But if, when Christ prays on our behalf in the way of the Holy Spirit, we're going to fall. We're going to trip up. Um, but we'll never give over to it. We'll, we'll never turn away and never look back. There's that perseverance that will always take place. And Jesus had prayed that for Peter. But Peter certainly was tripping up a lot. He cut off the ear. Um, and then even after, you know, Jesus said this, you know, Peter was like, no, never. I would never do that, Lord. I'd never. And then, of course, immediately after that happens, immediately after that rooster crows, Christ just looks at him. And, and Peter remembered. He, he had forgotten. In the midst of everything, he had forgotten. And I can't imagine... I, I can imagine the feeling of that. And we all do that. You know, I, I can't think of how many times, and, and, I, and I've kind of started the practice of not doing this, but I've certainly done it a lot in the past where in dealing with a certain sin, I'll be like, Lord, I promise, never again. It's over. It's done. Never going to participate in that sin again. And, of course, that's not how it works. Um, and that's why I think Scripture is so clear about let your yeses be yes and no's be no's. Don't make covenants. Don't make promises that you can't keep. Um, just say what you're going to do and, and, and hold to that. But uh, Peter, um, you know, he remembered, and he said in verse 62, it says, He went out and wept bitterly, as I would too, (laughs) as I would too, looking at my master, realizing that I had just denied him three times. I mean, we're just a couple hours after sitting at a table, fellowshipping in the Lord's Supper, and I just find myself in the midst of sin. I just denied him. I've denied my God, the person who I recognized as Lord, Christ, the, the Son of God. Um, I've just denied him three times, just like he said I would. An, an, an awful moment for for Peter, um, but one that would um, he would he would soon use, and, and the Lord would use to grow him and strengthen him um, to to a, to a wonderful wonderful disciple. Verse sixty three. Now the men who are holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him prophecy. Who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. And so we end finally um, through verse 65 here with the fact that day hasn't even approached yet. Um, It could still be Thursday night. Most likely at this point, we're probably looking at early, early Friday morning before the day begins. Um, It's, 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 you know, uh, uh, Passover for northern Israel. Southern Israel is about to start that process. And, and Jesus is, is in custody, and they were holding him, and they just started beating him and mocking him. And they, they would cover his eyes and uh, beat him, hit him, and then say, Hey, prophesy, you know, you who say you're the king of the Jews, the son of God, who hits you? You should know that, right? Um, and, of course, he did. And it's so it's so crazy to me to think about God's <laughs> patience for us. Because it's in these moments where he could have easily said, well, he hit me. Well, he hit me. Well, he did this. Well, he did that. And it would have been so miraculous that they would have been like, okay, yeah, I'm not not going against this guy. This obviously makes a lot of sense. 
um, you know, he was right. Because, but they didn't believe that he could do it, but he knew that if he did do it, then that might, you know, and, and of course he would know, um, but if he did do it, then that would, that would move him away from dying for us. And so those same people that are striking him and making funning, making fun of him and blaspheming him, he's about to die for and he knows it. But he knows that if he, um, you know, submits to the mockery and, and or not submits to it, but, but goes against it and, and fights against it and proves who he is, um, then that death that we so need today would have never happened. And so in closing, it's an hour at this point, so we definitely need to close. Um, you know, as we as we meditate on what Christ has done for us on this Thursday, if we've as we've walked with him from this Thursday night, an awful Thursday night in terms of suffering and persecution, but yet also a much needed step that led to each one of us hearing the gospel, having the Holy Spirit having a relationship with God. It's something that had to happen. So I hope that through this study, we have a better understanding maybe of the Lord's Supper, maybe a better understanding of what happened that night in the garden um, and and all of the the different things that connected um, that will lead to what we study tomorrow, which again is the trial and the crucifixion of our Lord. But uh, for this Thursday night, I hope you are able to meditate on that think about that as we go about this time for the rest of our evening that you know Christ whether he's doing the 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 Lord's Supper celebrating Passover um, or whether he's in the garden praying or, or whether he's being arrested and beaten whatever part of that night it is tonight you know may we remember that and, and may we take heed um, to that warning that he's given us to pray that we don't fall into temptation because temptation comes and we don't know when it's going to come but Jesus does and it normally comes way sooner than later, and we don't want to be on the negative end of that. So, um, you know, as we continue on, I, I hope that we can gain in people who come and watch this. So, so please spread word that we're walking through um, the life of Christ in these last four days. And so I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was uh, beneficial to you as it was for me. And that, uh, I, I, Lord, I just pray that you're glorified. So let's pray together, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, um, we recognize that your patience for us is beyond anything that's humanly possible and that no human could tolerate um, what you tolerated that Thursday night. Um, going through the Lord's Supper and knowing that the disciples didn't understand what you meant um, by the eating of your flesh and the drinking of your blood or even probably the new covenant um, or that you would see those people who fellowshiped with you and worshiped with you uh, in that moment instantly reject you fall asleep when they're supposed to be praying, commit violence when um, that's the opposite of what you were trying to do, and then leave you, as we'll read about soon. So, Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given us. We thank you for um, suffering that and, and, and continuing through that disobedience and that persecution that you went through that would one day soon, as we're going to read, lead to your sacrifice for us. And so... Father, I pray for each person here. If they don't know you, I pray that they would come to know you, that they would hear the gospel, that they would understand the gospel, they would believe it, they would confess you as Lord and uh, receive that Holy Spirit so that now that, unlike the disciples, they, they have the ability and the desire to be obedient to the life that you've called us to live. So, Lord, be glorified these next few days. and um, Be with these families. Um, may, may there not be a family in this area that goes without hearing your gospel this weekend and um, help us during this time as well thank you for everything Uh, do what you will lord in jesus name amen all right guys remember uh tomorrow we'll we'll start our our friday study at 6 p.m so join us at 6 p.m and we'll continue on from there thanks so much for joining us god bless